Hi, this is Camille Fairborn from Utah State University, and I'd like to welcome you to today's CAUSE Teaching and Learning webinar. We're pleased to have as our presenters today Dr. Dr. Jennifer Kaplan, who is an Associate Professor at the University of Georgia, and Dr. Neil Robness, a full professor at Grand Valley State. Their topic today is using a faculty learning community to develop high-impact, little-time activities to help students better understand the meaning of parameter. The way the webinars work is that all listeners are muted during the webinar. You can ask questions at any time by typing them into a, the chat box. We'll be sure to ask those questions towards the end and give Jennifer and Neil a chance to respond. You can also use the chat box if you're having any technical questions. So at this point, I'll turn things over to Drs. Kaplan and Rognes. Jennifer, go ahead. And I hope I said your name right, Neil. I forgot to ask. Thank you, Camille. So this is Jennifer, and I'm going to start. I'm going to do the first couple of slides. Neil and I are going to tag team today um, for the talk. Um, and we're going to tell you a little bit about the project we've been working on for the last year and that we'll be working on for the rest of this year, this academic year. Um, so our motivation for the project, um, a number of years ago we started studying language in the classroom and one of the words that we noticed students having trouble with was the word random because when we as statisticians think of randomness, we think about dice and we think about drawing names out of a hat and flipping a coin, but what our students were thinking of is, oh my god, that's so random, you know, it's something that's just weird or out of the blue or haphazard, and so in order to try to help students connect the idea of statistical randomness to the ideas we wanted and not to this um, colloquial idea of random, I came up with an activity where I contrasted some random zebras with a random hat, um, showing them a picture of zebras um, standing by the, people in zebra costumes standing by the side of the road um, versus showing them a shaking hat for drawing out of a hat. And the zebra hat activity was really quite a quick activity. Um, and in less than 15 minutes, I saw that my my students at the end of the semester were doing a lot better job describing how to take a random sample but also giving definitions for the word random. Um, and you can read more about that project in our search paper in 2014. The references will be at the end of the slides. But that was our motivation, that I had this under 15 minute activity that seemed to really help in terms of our student, my students being able to give better responses to defining random and describing how to take a random sample. Um, so the project is really based around using professional development to using a professional development model to create more activities like my zebra hat activity for random. So we looked into the professional development literature and the successful models for professional development, and this is for university level instructors, um, the research is different than it is for K-12 instructors, but basically the successful professional development models, they last over an extended period of time, they're focused and they're coordinated. Um, they're, it's not just have your faculty come to a meeting to talk about teaching, but specific talking about specific problems. So in our case, we're thinking about talking about language use and how we can address the problems that language may um, have in the classroom. Um, university instructors like to be provided with evidence of a problem. They want to know that there's a reason they're going to change their teaching, that there's a reason they're going to do something different. What is it about student learning that's not working? What is it about their teaching that's not working? What changes can they make to address that problem? Also, university instructors, we're experts in our field, and we like to be empowered. I mean, we, we know our subject. We know statistics. Um, we want to have that same empowerment in our teaching um, so giving a university instructor a prepackaged um, activity to use, a prepackaged curriculum module, none of us are going to use it the way we get it. We all want to change it. We all want to make it ours. We all want to do something interesting with it. We end up reinventing um, the instructional changes, um, but also the, the successful professional development models 
offer a collective community that the instructors instructors can get together and talk about what they're doing and make their reinventions by talking to other people. Um, and of course, if if we want to be convinced that the time we are taking to do the professional development to change our teaching is worth it, we want feedback on the instructional change and on the student outcomes that come through with the the, the change. So, and this is what's this is what the literature told us. Um, and we read this before we designed our project. So now let me tell you a little bit about sort of the key terms that we have that, that, we'll, that Neil and I will both use. Um, lexical ambiguity, words that are lexically ambiguous have different meeting, meanings. Um, so homonyms and homophones are sort of easy cases of lexical ambiguity, there and there. Um, we have some lexically ambiguous mathematics words like pi and pi. Um, the minus and the tree are, that's leaves. So we say seven minus four leaves three. Um, but words are lexically ambiguous. So like random where it can mean haphazard colloquially, but random actually means something that is um, quite systematic in statistics. If we think about the word bias in statistics, bias is a systematic misrepresentation. Bias in colloquial language is about being pushed to being, it's almost like, well, skew, being pushed to one side. Um, and it's not, it's not, it, it really isn't the same. Um, so we've been thinking about these lexically ambiguous words for a long time, and why is this important? Um, when novices approach a new subject, and particularly a science or a science of mathematics, any of the STEM forms, um, the jargon that we use makes the subjects seem more difficult than they really are. People, people when they hear scientific jargon, they think, oh, you need to be a genius like Einstein to be able to understand physics or to be able to understand mathematics or to be able to understand statistics. So this language can provide a barrier to entry for students. And if we address the language issue, if we help students to understand our statistical language, we, we think we will be lowering those barriers to entry. But the other thing is that we communicate our subject through our language and we allow our, the way we assess our students is through their use of language. We have to communicate in order to explain our subject and our students have to communicate so that we can assess whether they've learned our subject. So we really can't get away from language. Um, so understanding how these words affect student learning, how the use of the words affect student learning is really important to promoting student learning. And so the last bit of sort of jargon in our talk is Neil and I will talk about the HILT activities. Um, HILT stands for high impact, little time. So we we're trying to develop activities that have high impact on student understanding, but require little time to implement. We all know that in statistics courses, we have way more material than we can possibly cover in our semester. So we want to make sure that you know when we bring in these activities, we're not taking time away from something else, but that it's it's a quick thing that really it's a big bang for the buck, so that we don't overstep the time that we have in the semester. So that with that, I am now going to turn it over to Neil, who can correct me if I said anything wrong in the first couple of slides. Oh, you're doing fine, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so there's a there's a lot I could talk about with this slide. Maybe doing a brief overview of how our project has been set up would be helpful. Um, the, as Jennifer mentioned, we have a two-year NSF grant that we're working on. We're currently in year two, and uh, that will go into May 2017. And the first year of the grant coincided with my year-long sabbatical that I just came off of last year. So. <clears throat> Um, in a year ago, summer, so that would be summer of 2015, the project team we organized and then led a, a workshop for the six participating faculty members that are in our study. And the goals of our workshop were, were multi in nature, including we wanted to introduce them to the concept of lexical ambiguity. 
we also wanted to get them acquainted with the, the research that the project team has been working on specifically um, on lexical ambiguity and also to give them a chance to um, be, become familiar with the zebra versus hat activity which Jennifer uh, mentioned earlier. We also wanted them to identify some word or words of personal interest that they thought might have lexical ambiguity and were uh, perhaps troublesome for students. And we also wanted to give them an opportunity to become familiar with technology that they would be using as part of the study because they are recording themselves using the activities in their classrooms. So we wanted to give them a chance to become acquainted with that. And then in the fall of 2015 semester, all of the six faculty members actually tested the zebra versus hat activity that Jennifer mentioned in their own particular classrooms and recorded them using that. And that would provided them with the foundation for how to implement a health activity into their classrooms. At the same time that they were doing that, they were also working on developing one or more new health activities that corresponded to the word or words that they had identified in the summer as personal, of, uh, personal interest to investigate. And um, then in the winter of 2016, yes, I did say winter semester. We don't call it spring. It's, it is Michigan, by the way. Um, the six faculty, um, also, then they, they tested their new health activities that they had developed in the previous semester in the classrooms. And during both the fall and the winter semesters, the health faculty met with two members of the project team. One of them with, was with me face to face and the other with Jennifer remotely through Blackboard Collaborate. And we met on a bi-weekly basis and this allowed them to get some feedback on the activities that they were developing, drafts of their activities, and to talk about accomplishments that they've had in the classroom as well as any challenges that they've encountered. And this was certainly a key part of the faculty learning community component of our research study. And then last summer, 2016, the project team again we organized and led another workshop for the six instructors and, and one of the main goals of the workshop was to share with them some initial analyses that we've been doing on the data that we've been collecting from at the student level um, for each of the health activities and Jennifer will be sharing some of those um, out uh, those uh, um, analyses here shortly. And then the current semester, fall 2016, now the, the six health instructors are testing um, a new act, uh, another health activity in the classrooms, but one that they did not really have direct input in terms of uh, developing themselves. So it's kind of a swap and trade kind of thing where they're putting their own unique spins on it. And we continue to meet with them on a bi-weekly basis. So with respect to outcomes from our study, what we're hoping at the end is that we're going to have a set of classroom tested health activities with evidence of their overall effectiveness and as well as the um, creation and development of a wiki space. We've already started on it and we'll be adding to it. And uh, Jennifer will be talking about some of those aspects in uh, a little bit. So next slide, Jennifer. So who are these uh, six participating faculty that we keep referring to as health instructors? Um, they're faculty who are principally teaching STAT 215, which is our introductory statistics course at Grand Valley. Most of the faculty are affiliate faculty, which is a um, type of permanent full-time non-tenure track position. And all of them have had at least two years teaching experience with teaching staff to 15. Many of them have had more um, than just the two years. We also have a group of instructors that we invited to um, participate in the study, um, and they agreed to do so as comparison instructors. This group, again, was also teaching STAT 215 in their respective semesters. And they were much more eclectic in composition, so they included some relatively new instructors as well as some more seasoned teachers. And we desired to have um, the comparison instructors possess similar rigor as that of the HILT instructors with respect to STAT 215. So one of the factors that was considered in, in identifying who to invite was looking at their mean course grades in STAT 215 and trying to come up with a similar pool of uh, individuals that we could use as comparison instructors. <clears throat> Next slide, Jennifer. 
So these next two slides that we're going to be showing are highlighting two activities that were developed specifically related to um, the word parameter as well as its interplay with the word statistic, population, and sample. So the first activity um, is more of a, what I would call a classroom manipulative that involved a population of different colored candy-coated chocolate candies. And the colloquial or everyday usage of the word parameter was introduced by emphasizing larger peppermint wafer candy doesn't meet the guidelines or slash boundaries slash parameters for being a member of the population so therefore it doesn't fit that aspect of parameter and then the statistical use of the word parameter was introduced <clears throat> as shown in the other picture as shown uh, on, the, on the slide and the instructor then used manipulative to demonstrate drawing samples from the population and comparing and contrasting a statistic with the parameter, etc. The other activity that was developed specifically for parameter, this one kind of took on more of a look and feel of the zebra versus hat activity. It was PowerPoint based, where first students were asked to consider both colloquial and statistical definitions of parameter. And then the, uh, the person who developed this activity. Um, introduced the concept of the all versus the small to contrast the population with the sample. And um, both of these activities really were quite memorable with respect to later classroom reminders where they could go back and say, you know, remember the candy manipulative, manipulative that we um, introduced earlier or remember the all versus small activity that we uh, looked at previously. And based on the feedback from the health instructors, both of these activities took relatively little time to introduce and to subsequently remind students about throughout the semester. Again, both of them estimated that they spent less than 15 minutes um, total throughout the semester introducing and uh, further emphasizing these activities. So really a, a small amount of, of investment in terms of classroom time. I think, and now we go back to Jennifer, I'm not mistaken. So one of the, as I, as I said earlier, one of the things with faculty professional development and one of the things about, you know, our goals for the project are to see whether the work we're doing is helpful for the students. So as Neil said, we had HILT instructors who developed activities and used them in their classroom and we, we also recruited a set of comparison instructors. Um, teaching a similar class and you know having a similar background to our HILT instructors and we collected data from the students of both HILT instructors and comparison instructors and what we're showing now are some preliminary results we haven't had a chance to look at all of the data yet but we put a, an, a, a question on final exams um, to a content question about parameter so in the first question, the students were supposed to identify whether the mean GPA of all students at GVSU was a parameter, a population, a sample, or a statistic. And the answer is supposed to be parameter. Um, when I show the results, the more purple or blue colors at the bottom are always the more correct answers. So we want to see more of the blue and purple. So here we have the results. So the students who saw the candy activity um, and the all versus small activity were more likely to select the collect correct response parameter um, than the comparison than the students of the comparison instructors. Um, so and we've got the so we we think we are making progress. Uh, you know there is some issue that there still there still is some confusion about. The difference between statistic but we've gotten rid of you know the students have moved from being confused about what is a population and what is a sample and they've gone the right direction to parameter so we may still have some work to do about you know how to help them distinguish between a parameter and a statistic um, we also um, we have what we call the lexical ambiguity question um, where we ask students to provide a definition for the target word um, in the first prompt, 
the students are pro providing a definition and a sentence for the word parameter. In our second prompt, we ask them to, to compare and contrast parameter and statistic. I'm only going to show the results from the first prompt um, because those are the ones we have um, analyzed. So this is our coding rubric currently. So again, as I said, anything down at the bottom in the purples and blues, those we consider to be better answers. So the purple is going to be the correct statistical response, um, where a parameter is a numerical value that summarizes the population. Um, but sometimes students will give us an example of a parameter. Um, and then the greens, we have um, an incomplete, that, that a parameter is something about the population. Um, the lighter green is where they start to be confusing population, sample, data, um, with the idea of parameter. And then the oranges, the orange and the red, these are the more colloquial definitions that a parameter is a guideline, a condition, or we do sometimes get that parameter is the length of the outside edges. In other words, they're defining the word perimeter. So these are the results. Um, what we hope you will notice here is that the students of the Hilt instructors were more likely to give either a correct statistical definition or to give an example of a specific, a correct parameter. Um, and much less, you know, we don't, we're not seeing any of the oranges and reds. We're not seeing any of the colloquial definitions. Um, they may have some incomplete statistical, and again, we may still be talking about populations and samples um, and not about parameters, but we've gone away from the 20% or so who are of students who are giving colloquial definitions. So we think we're showing progress here as well. Um, Neil, you were going to talk about this. I am. So this is a list of the um, various activities that have been developed to date um, through the grant. We recall that one of the objectives was to come up with a set of health activities. So um, we've got activities for correlation, parameter, normal, residual, and skew. And uh, it's, it's really quite eclectic in terms of the style. Some of them are much more PowerPoint based, which is, which is fine. Um, there's one that involves a um, original song composition to help the students understand the word correlation. And there's a couple that are more what I would call manipulative or based, which includes the one on parameter that we featured here. There's another one that involves residual, that involves a pizza box in which there is residual or leftover pieces of pizza to uh, tap into the everyday usage of the word residual. And then it also includes a graph on the back side of the box, um, which is, I believe, it's looking at uh, the number of toppings on the x-axis and the calories involved in the y-axis in the scatter plot of the data, including the residual um, values for um, trying to estimate um, the being able to predict um, calories based on number of toppings. So, um, and Jennifer is going to talk briefly about the other expected outcomes. So, and, and this is sort of our teaser for U.S. COTS. We hope to be presenting this there. Um, one of the goals of the project is to take the activities that our participating faculty have created and load them into a wiki space. Um, we have videotapes of all of the instructors doing activities. We have their slides. We have pictures of their manipulatives. We have the the results, the student level results, and we're planning to load all of those into this wiki space so that other instructors can then go and watch the recordings to see what the activity looks like as it's demonstrated and can download the materials that are needed to do the activity in class. We're also hoping to sort of continue the professional development model, not necessarily on site, but remotely. We know that a lot of statistics instructors are um, they're isolated. They don't necessarily have three colleagues with whom they could meet on a bi-weekly basis to discuss their teaching. So the idea is that 
we're going to ask people who use the wiki space to mentor other people who want to use the wiki space. Um, Camille, it's all very well and good that you gave them the URL, but I think we have it locked down right now so that people can't visit it because there's not much there. Um, so I should, I'm just going to say that. But, okay. um, oh, the URL is on the, on the, sorry, anyway, I digress. Um, but the idea is that this will be a place for people to come and that, that participating instructors will mentor other instructors. And if you as an instructor use one of the activities but you modify it, we're going to ask that you submit your modifications to us so that we can upload the modifications um, also to the wiki space so that this could be sort of a living and breathing um, place for uh, professional development and creation of activities and of course at some point we will probably open it up not just to language but to other types of HILT activities. Neil, do you want to talk about this? Sure, yeah, sure. Um, what we've done is um, collect a lot of student level data but we also went back to the HILT instructors and uh, try to get feedback from them too. And so we have an external evaluator and at the end of both the fall and the winter semesters of year one, the faculty were surveyed. Um, and so these are just some snippets of information that um, have been provided. Um, so we're pleased to see that the health instructors um, perceive that they're getting the support that they need to develop the activities and also that they believe the activities are going to be helpful in terms of um, gaining, um, helping students gain a better understanding of statistical concepts. And this was, again, emphasized last summer when they um, saw the data analysis from their individual projects. And so the next couple of slides show some um, comments that the HILT instructors were, were providing. I'll, I'll let you, you can come back and read through these on, on, on your own, but basically some highlights are the project, uh, they felt the project was helpful to improve their teaching. Uh, as well as helping to increase the awareness of the phenomenon of the lexical ambiguity and also the benefit of having these regular um, teaching fo focused interactions with other colleagues. In fact, one of the participants, um, she intends to create an informal teaching circle um, so they, they can continue the perceived benefit for, that they've had from this project. Um, and then the last slide here is in terms of what um, impact they think the project has had on their students. And again, just to highlight a few things that, uh, that they think the students help to bring to light the confusion which can exist among students about some of the keywords, um, um, meaning of keywords, and the belief that students will now better understand the statistical meaning of these words by participating in the project. So I think the last set of slides are um, reference material that we've used. And there's a list of our publications as well as how to get a hold of us. Well, thanks to you both for uh, presenting today. We have some time for questions. If you'd like to type them into either the questions box or the chat box, uh, we can ask those to Neil and Jennifer right now. It looks like uh, maybe we don't have as many questions as sometimes. Uh, you're, I was able to actually access that website, but it looks like there's just your references mostly for the HILT uh, space. But that sounds like a very exciting way to share what you're doing. Um, have you had ex outside interest already with other people to come in and, and be part of these teaching circles? What other like institutions or places are people coming from? We haven't. I mean, we we've sort of, as I said, I thought periodically I lock down the wiki space and then open it back up um, because we don't have much there yet. Um, so we haven't advertised. Our plan is to sort of launch the wiki the wiki space at US COTS and make our okay. big announcement then. So this is the pre-announcement. Okay. Um, so. So we expect that by next May we'll have videos and materials loaded into the wiki space and the student level results 
Um, that's one of the things we're working on this year, sort of in the background, while we're also still working with the faculty members. Uh, we do have one, a couple of questions now from uh, attendees. Did you find, this is from John Gabrasek, did you find any words that you aren't satisfied with the activities? Um, no, not, none that come to my mind. Um, Jennifer, did anything that strike you as, I think, you know, they, they've all embraced the, the, the study um, and some of them found it a little bit more challenging than others to come up with the Hills activity, but now that they've developed it, I think there is this, this great sense of accomplishment. And you know, it was it was also the fact that over the summer, when, when they were able to see some of the results, and see that there were actually gains in student understanding relative to the comparison instructors, that the activity seemed to be making a difference. Um, again, you know, there's there's the, always the confounding issue: you know, is it the activity or is it the way the instructor is teaching? You know, that, right. that has to be teased out. But um, um, but you know, but yeah, yeah, no, I. I I think going into it, we, we had no idea what the faculty would come up with. Um, I think they were concerned about whether they could come up with something. And the fact that every one of the six faculty members came up with something, and some of them are very creative, you know, some of them are more creative than others, but they're all fairly creative. I mean, they all came up with something from nothing, and and they're all still sticking with it and have found value in being part of the program that, you know, I, and and none of their students exhibited less understanding than the comparison. So, you know, I think it's, I think it's been quite successful for our, for the faculty with whom we're working. And then another question from Jane, how do these HILT activities translate into online courses? Have you given any thought to that? Um, no. Actually, one of the instructors that's participating in our study is actually teaching a hybrid section this semester, and so um, we're, we're kicking around, you know, how what's the best way to incorporate the health activities into that environment. So I guess the the answer to that question would be to stay tuned, and uh, I'm sure we'll be sharing what we find um, in terms of how that works. Um, and then the source to access these activities, that's just your website that will be going online sometime next year, is that? Yeah, the wiki space, okay. right. The wiki spaces. Okay. Well, I think that is all the questions we have. Again, thanks to both of you for presenting to, for us today. We don't currently have any webinars on deck for cause for the next month, but I encourage you to keep an eye on your email and an eye on the CAUSE website for announcements of upcoming webinars. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time.